Welcome to the Performance Prescription Lab podcast. Here we are with another Paris 2024 special episode where we will share the top 10 medical highlights from the 2024 Paralympic Games in Paris. More than 4,400 athletes from around the world took center stage, competing for 549 medals across 22 incredible sports, everything from wheelchair fencing to blind soccer. For 11 days, we witnessed athletes pushing their bodies and minds to the absolute limits in their quest for gold. These games were more than just a display of athletic prowess. They were a testament to the human spirit and the capacity to try despite physical, mental or intellectual impairments. Spirit in motion is the official Paralympic Games motto and we witnessed the strong spirits of Paralympians throughout the Paris 2024 Paralympics. What do you think about the opening ceremony of the Paralympics, Jess? Yeah, I I enjoyed the opening ceremonies and I think it really like set the tone um, as the artistic director, Thomas Jolly, kind of said the theme around it was paradox. And he, he kind of described it. And, you know, I always am grateful that they have um, people that explain it because I did not come from a very artistic background. So having people explain what is going on and the meaning behind it is usually helpful for me. But I do think that he captured it perfectly when he said that Paris was not completely adapted for people with disabilities. And the theme of paradox highlighted the ongoing conversation about inclusion and the way society views disabilities. Um, It wasn't just a spectacle. I feel like the opening um, opening ceremonies were kind of like a statement. It entertained us, but more importantly, it challenged us to rethink our perceptions. It's the power of the Paralympics. And we're here today and we're going to break down some of the top medical highlights that showcase the the cool part of the games and um, just all about the athletes, which I was really thankful got to see more of the Paralympics than I've ever seen because of it being actually televised more. So I'm going to start off with our first health topic that came out of Paralympics. And this is something I think is across sports in general and just more awareness. And that has to do with concussions and athletes. And I think I really kind of really noticed this and like thought about it when I was watching, um, I think it was wheelchair basketball. And these guys were like falling on the ground, you know, completely strapped into their wheelchairs and it looked pretty violent. And I was like, wow, I wonder if they get concussions. So I started looking into this a little bit more. And as we know, concussions have become a very prominent topic in things like American football and rugby because of the long-term health risk that concussions um, pose for all of us. But it extends beyond traditional sports. And we need to think about it in terms of like the Olympic Games where athletes compete at the highest level and they have disabilities. So concussions actually can present a unique set of challenges that you might not think about. Many um, healthcare providers and scientists highlight that more needs to be done to diagnose and prevent concussions among Paralympic athletes. But one thing that they need to, we're highlighting is that the diagnosing of a concussion in this population can be very complex. You have to think that like when we have normal athletes that, uh, or traditional athletes, we assess symptoms like double vision or loss of balance but it's not always appropriate for athletes with disabilities. For example, like you can't do a vision test on an athlete who is visually impaired and you can't do a balance test for someone who uses a wheelchair. So you lose some of these traditional test methods to determine of concussions. So we believe the, the research kind of shows that it, it's believed that concussions in Paralympic communities may be underreported. Some Paralympic sports represent higher risk for concussions due to the nature nature of the competition. So you kind of think of like five-a-side football where it's played by athletes with visual impairment and all athletes are blindfolded to ensure that they have an even playing field. So according to one Paralympic, this game is intense, fast-paced, and inevitably leads to collisions because all players are blindfolded. And sadly, the increased risk of head-to-head contact also increases, creating an environment where concussions are very real risk. 
but five aside football isn't the only sport alpine skiing judo taekwondo cycling all also carry significant risk and high speed sports like skiing and cycling crashes are inevitable and they pose a chance for head injuries and like i said kind of saw it and even wheelchair basketball seemed pretty pretty intense so um the consequences of concussions for visually impaired athletes may be particularly severe. They were looking at a small study involving English blind football players and participants reported that concussions actually negatively affected their spatial awareness and their sleep, both obviously, as we know, are critical for daily functioning. So given the risk, the players use verbal cues Um, shouting to indicate to others the position on the field or when they're about to be tackled to kind of help reduce the risk of collisions. So just something to be aware of about the risk of concussions and make it basically making sure we establish a baseline health profile before competition so that we can have better detection of concussions in Paralympic athletes and baseline you know, they do a lot of tests for traditional athletes, but we need to make sure that we're doing baseline tests for our Paralympic athletes and having ways to measure the athlete's normal neurological functions and how they may change following an injury. Um, This simple step of having a baseline method may greatly improve concussion detection and provide athletes with better protection. With increased awareness, more comprehensive pre-competition health checks and implementations of protective measures um, like improved helmets and paddings. We're hoping that the Paralympic community can take important steps to reducing the risk of concussions in this community. It's very good uh, inspiration to the medical community, the Paralympics Games itself, because we knew, for example, from the COVID pandemic, where the personal protective equipment were prepared for male healthcare professionals rather mm-hmm. than for female healthcare professionals. So that Paralympic creates a good, uh, created a good need or emerging need for uh, medical society to consider for everyone. And as sports pharmacists ourselves, we are responsible for giving care to everybody, uh, leaving no one behind. And from there, I want to move on to our next topic, It's another prominent topic about being more inclusive in healthcare. I wanted to start with the remarkable recovery journey of Lisa Corso, a legally blind runner who defied the odds at the 2024 Paris Paralympics. Not only did she claim bronze in the women's 1,500 meters T13 category, but she did so while battling a serious injury, one that could have sidelined her completely. After qualifying for Paralympics, she was diagnosed with a stress fracture in her femur, one of the most challenging injuries an athlete can face, especially for runners. And here is the kicker. She wasn't allowed to run for six weeks leading up to the Games. In total, she only ran eight miles during that time. That's, I think, the total amount of (laughs) me running for my own, for (laughs) myself. So that's a nightmare for an athlete. I can't imagine. Yeah. But what's even more impressive is how she kept her hope alive and maintained her fitness by switching to low-impact training, biking, and pool sessions to protect her injury while staying in peak condition. Her resilience is a great example of not giving up, even when the circumstances seem impossible. But this also brings attention to a larger issue that affects many female endurance athletes, stress fractures and reds or relative energy deficiency in sports. It's important for athletes and coaches to recognize that a stress fracture could be a warning sign of something more serious like reds, especially when athletes aren't getting the nutrition they need to support their training. Stress fractures can be an early indicator of reds which impacts bone health, menstrual function, and overall performance. Female athletes, particularly endurance athletes, are at higher risk, and awareness is key. Lisa's story not only highlights her personal determination, but also underscores the importance of understanding and addressing reds. Lisa's story proves us that with the right approach to recovery, even the toughest setbacks can be overcome. 
but it also stresses the importance of listening to your body, but education and awareness around athlete health. And another way that Paralympics creates another medical awareness. I think that that just highlights, you know, whether or not hers was caused because of that syndrome is is not known, but it definitely highlights the importance of understanding, listening to our bodies and understanding conditions that are out there that maybe, you know, a lot of healthcare providers have never heard of REDS or understand even what the low energy availability that comes kind of before REDS, you know, they are not understand. They don't always understand all the warning signs that athletes may present with and be helping them be able to identify that before it progresses to longer term health conditions. Um, this kind of leads us to our next topic, which is again, female athletes um, and that we were super excited to see another pregnant athlete do so well in the Paralympics. Um, a record, almost 2,000 women, so 1,983 women were expected to be among the 4,400 athletes competing in the medal events. The, this is a new record, um, which is about 45%, and it beats the 42% that was set at uh, Tokyo 2020 and more than doubles the 988 female athletes that competed at Sydney in 2000. So Please. super exciting to see more female athletes at the Paralympics. But in Paris 2024, it featured more medal events for women than ever before. So we're now at 235, which is super cool to see the growth in all across sports. But as we know, women are truly amazing. And British pair archer Jody Grinham not only competed, but won a bronze medal while seven months pregnant. She showed the world that being pregnant doesn't stop you from reaching your goals. And it's not just about her physical strength. It was about managing the complexities that come with pregnancy from the physical challenges to the mental pressures. To perform under these circumstances and still stand on the podium, I think just speak, is an achievement that speaks volumes. That women's bodies are capable of incredible things. And Jody is a shining example of that. That her performance at the Paralympics not only highlights her own resilience, but also challenges the perception of what female, or sorry, that what pregnant athletes can achieve. Another great story, like the one that we shared in the Olympic episode. We are so uh, inspired to see such news and also going up the podium with your little one. Yes. <laughs> really exciting. Probably youngest Olympian ever. Yeah, probably, exactly. <laughs> Olympian. I would like to continue with another story, and it's about an exciting rule change at the 2024 Paris, Paris Paralympics. This rule change allowed athletes with cochlear implants to wear them during competition, giving them the chance to hear the crowd for the very first time. I can't imagine this had to have been a huge moment for many athletes who had never experienced the roar of the crowd during the events. For athletes with hearing impairments, the ability to wear the cochlear implants in competition was not just a game changer, but it was an emotional experience. And I think the, the mental uh, health and the emotional health adds so much to an athlete's performance and also the, the, the satisfaction feeling you get from your sports. And this rule change allowed that. A deaf world championship swimmer, Susanna Hicks, posted when she arrived at Paris 2024 that she can't wait to hear the crowds for the first time at the Paris Paralympics. That rule change in 2023 means Susanna Hicks from Calm in Wiltshire can wear her cochlear implant during her race. She was born with a hearing impairment and is now profoundly deaf and she competed in the s 500 meter freestyle. She said in an interview, having that crowd and the feel of the atmosphere, it's got to give you a buzz to get down that pool pretty quick. I think it's a performance enhancement. And uh, she was left paralyzed from the waist down after a freak accident, that's how she called it. 
Imagine training your whole life in near silence and then for the first time hearing the cheers, excitement and energy of the stadium as you compete. Must be an amazing and incredible feeling. And to think about how much this rule change enhances the overall experience for the athletes is just incredible. Yeah. It's a reminder that sports aren't just physical, it's emotional for sure. And this rule change is just another example of how the Paralympics continue to evolve, inspire, putting athletes first and breaking down the barriers. Yeah. I love that story. I, I actually did not know until reading that, that, um, that they weren't allowed to wear cochlear implants during the Paralympics. Um, so I, I just can't imagine not hearing the crowds. I mean, being an athlete and, you know, having your quote unquote home field advantage because your crowd is so big and so much emotion behind it. I can't imagine like swimming at Paralympics and not being able to hear people cheering you on. So that is, that is, I think a really cool rule change that definitely improves sport for the athlete or the experience too. Yeah, it's the, the, it's very uh, relevant to the spirit of sport in my yes. opinion. I agree with that. Um, the next health topic we're going to move to is that COVID continued. Uh, following concerns raised about elite athletes com- competing with COVID during the Olympics, public health experts have been calling for improved measures to sh- safeguard not only the athletes, but the coaches, volunteers, and spectators. Um, Professor Linda Slack-Smith, who is a um, social epidemiologist from the University of Western Australia emphasized that the Paralympics offer a chance uh, to rethink how we manage COVID, especially given that many Paralympians have many health conditions or comorbidities that actually put them at higher risk for severe illness or long COVID than you would see in even like an Olympian, um, because a lot of these guys do have compromised systems. And it's not just about the athletes. Glenn Ramos, um, a health expert promoter, pointed out that this kind of quote unquote laissez faire approach to COVID management does send a harmful message that the virus is of little consequence when in reality, we saw athletes struggling with infections, withdrawing from events, and in some cases being in distress um, during their competition because they had COVID or had symptoms. It was interesting because the Australian Olympic Committee Committee um, emphasized that they had thorough testing protocols in place, including um, isolating positive cases and promoting mask wearing. And the fact that some athletes continue to compete with COVID raised serious questions about the balance between um, performance and health safety. So I think um, after this Olympics, it, I, it'll be interesting to see kind of how they how they handle it, especially between the Olympics and Paralympics, having very similar um, situations with um, COVID outbreaks. Yeah, I would have expected uh, different precautions about the COVID-19 and maybe health in general. And it was worrying to see athletes having COVID because it has so much negative, mostly have a negative impact on athletes. So... Maybe they just uh, follow the herd in minutes yeah. perspective. I don't know. <laughs> the other part that uh, makes me think is like, did they have a pharmacist helping them manage the symptoms? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and making sure they weren't taking banned substances because there's so there are things that obviously, you know, we both know are banned that would help yeah. with the symptoms of managing COVID, of yeah. like congestion and stuff. So it's just kind of interesting. How did they manage the symptoms? Who mm-hmm. guided them? What was what were they? What did they do in order to be able to still compete, even though being symptomatic? Yeah, I think we are gonna learn about this soon in our next episode. But stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> yes, we'll share more details about our next episode. Some really good insights from the Paralympics itself about sports pharmacy. But up next, uh, we are going to talk about injuries, particularly those affecting wheelchair athletes. Dr. Cherry Blauet, a seven-time Paralympic medalist for Team USA, who is now an associate professor at the Harvard Medical School, is also was my instructor at the IOC Drugs and Sports Program. She gave an amazing lecture about the healthcare of athletes with disabilities. 
Sherry Blauet is a leader in both Paralympic world and the medical community. She is not only lived through the physical demands of being a long-distance wheelchair racer, but she has also been researching sports injuries among El Paralympians. And I've been exposed to this research as well, and we would like to share this with you. One of the most striking findings from her research about Paralympians, especially wheelchair users, face significantly higher risk of injury than their Olympic counterparts. At the Rio 2016 Summer Games, 12% of Paralympic athletes reported injuries compared to just 8% of Olympic athletes. And it's even more concerning when you look at the winter sports. For example, Team USA para-athletes face almost double the injuries compared to Olympians. For wheelchair athletes, the most common injuries involve the shoulders, as Blauet points out, wheelchair users put an immense load on their shoulders, not just in sports, but in daily life, from pushing their chairs to simply getting in and out of bed. It's not just the athletic competition that takes a toll. Everyday tasks like getting dressed, driving, or even just moving around all rely on the same part of the body, their shoulders. For athletes, this repetitive strain can lead to serious issues, like rotator cuff tears or shoulder arthritis. And we are not just talking about injuries that affect performance. For wheelchair users, these injuries can have long-term consequences, potentially impacting their independence and ability to function in day-to-day -day life. It's important to note that sports itself isn't bad for wheelchair users. In fact, for non-elite athletes, sports can actually help strengthen the shoulders and reduce pain, However, at elite level, the intensity and the repetitive strain can result in overuse injuries, which can be debilitating if not managed properly. So here comes especially the very useful skills of healthcare professionals like sports pharmacists to help athletes with disabilities such as this uh, to prevent injuries at an early stage or at an early year so that the overuse uh, impact on the shoulders would be decreased as much as possible. Yeah. I think that's really good highlight of how, uh, you know, sports offers so many, so many positives and, you know, obviously there is injuries in sport can, you know, especially in a wheelchair user, you know, that you never think about how much it would impact their day to day life and their independence. So I think that's a great a highlight for, you know, and just kind of opening people's eyes to, you know, the differences and the ways to help, to support Paralympic athletes and even those with disabilities that may be in wheelchairs and having an understanding of them. So great, great topic to highlight. And I, I think the Paralympics wasn't just about athletic achievement. It, there, it's been cool to see as technology has grown, but the Paralympics also had some advancements in assistive technology, which allowed athletes to compete or to experience the event at the highest level. So assistive technology plays a key role in leveling the playing field, making sure athletes could perform at their best reg um, regardless of their physical, sensory, or intellectual impairments. From state-of-the-art prosthesis to adaptive sports equipment, it's amazing to see how technology is pushing the boundaries of what sports can do. One of the cool assisted devices that I saw in the Paralympics, it was during um, goalball. So goalball players, Matt um, Loftus and Lois Turner, were using this thing called a vision pad at the South Paris Arena. And so the vision pad is like a touch sensor interactive tablet that enables people with vision impairment to follow the position of the ball in real time and feel the vibrations as intensity and they feel vibrations as the kind of like the intensity of the competition increases. Um, seeing the two of them sit next to each other and watch the goal ball game on these vision pads was super interesting, I thought. And I was like, wow, they actually can experience the game. So I thought that was super cool. And these or innovations not only enhance performance, but they also improve our daily lives for people with disabilities. We saw, you know, obviously we talked about these prosthetic limbs that you see that used to be bulky and clunky are now cutting edge and like razors, you know, they don't weigh as much. They're very slim um, that they can do. A lot of people can do a lot of things with the prosthetics. Um, we see specialized 
wheelchairs for racing. We have advancement in hearing devices, including cochlear implants, which as um, Neilham already talked about, was allowing athletes to hear the roar of the crowd for the first time. And as we said, can you imagine the emotional impact that that had on those athletes? For many athletes, these devices are more than just tools. They are complete lifelines that offer the athlete independence and the ability to thrive, not only in sport, but in life. According to the WHO, about 2.5 billion people globally need one or more assistive products, yet nearly a billion of those lack access to them. So it was interesting to see the partnership between the WHO and the Paralympic Committee to help raise awareness and promote the availability of assistive technologies for all. So a positive that came out of the Paralympics and the growth of technology. Another, another one in the books. It's yeah. so, it created so much awareness. And again, giving the message about leaving no one behind is, I think, the team that emerged from the stories we shared. Yes. I'll talk about a fun fact, but it's more than a fun fact. I'll talk about the cool eye coverings. Oh, yes. I love but, them. Yes, me too. There were so many different patterns. I loved it. It was so funny. And while watching the Paralympic track events, I couldn't help notice some of the runners' uniforms, including this eye covering, some of which almost looked like a sleep mask or blindfold. And it's not just the paralytics track events where these coverings made an appearance. You may have seen uh, from the athletes playing blind football, golf ball, or more. And one of my favorites was D-Dash of Team Italy, who competed in the women's long jump T11 category at the Stade de France, wearing a butterfly-shaped blindfold. <laughs> The T11 classes for runners with near total visual impairment and all competitors wear full blindfolds. The long jumpers rely on guides to help them with audio cues as they approach the takeoff board. I strongly recommend you to see one if you haven't. Oh my gosh. Different. And speaking about D-Dash, uh, where is what is described as a butterfly-shaped blindfold bringing a sense of style to her equipment while in competition. Nothing more appropriate than a long jumper with wings, I guess. <laughs> perfect. I think it's perfect. And her, I loved her, her, butter, her butterfly mask. But I have to say that that is a lot of trust in your partner to have somebody give you visual cue or audio cues to jump off a board and land in a sand pit. I don't know if I could do that. My curiosity leads me looking into why Paralympians who are blind or have low vision sometimes wear eye shades while competing. And the answer was both more straightforward and it's a little bit more complex than I would expect it. As it turns out, these eye masks are all about leveling the playing fields, so to speak, and creating a more fair competition. That's because there is a range of vision impairment among the qualifying para competitors. We spoke about this in our Paralympic episode, our previous episode. Some athletes, para-athletes are blind, while others have differing levels of low vision. Eye shades ensure all athletes have equitable visual equity during co competition. Currently, athletes who are blind or have low vision can compete in the following Paralympic events. Track and field, triathlon, cycling, equestrian football, goal ball, judo, rowing, sailing, and swimming. And the rules for who's required to wear eye coverings and when varies by sport. For instance, with blind football, soccer, all outfield players must be classified as B1. This is defined as very low visual equity and or no light perception per the Paris 2024 site. And they wear eye shades, B1 categorized athletes, para-athletes. However, the goalkeeper can be fully sighted or partially sighted. This is called B2 or B3 classification. And the goalkeeper doesn't need to wear anything over the eyes. Whereas in goalball, all athletes must wear eye shades, including the goalkeeper. Blackout goggles are also required for para swimming, but only for races in the SSB11 sports class. Athletes with extremely low visual acuity and or no light perception. As far as para-athletics, the sport that includes running, jumping and throwing events, 
only T11 and F11 class updates are required to wear eye coverings, including gauze, patches, and opaque glasses or an equivalent substitute, according to World Para Athletics rules and regulations. Paralympians eye masks serve a functional purpose. They are cool, but they are not just cool, and they are taken very seriously by the event's rules. However, that hasn't stopped some athletes from leveraging them to make a statement. Paralympics competitors from all over the globe have been donning creative eye shades, some with feathers, funky patterns, some with butterfly shapes, others with images that celebrate their home country. And it's also another manifestation of them being an athlete. I just loved it. I loved it. I thought they were, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I saw it more and more. I was like, actually, that's really fun that they allowed them to have personalized or be able to <laughs> showcase some of their own style and their um, and their eye shades. Like, I really enjoyed seeing some of what people had created. They got very creative, I felt like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a manifestation of their personality yep. and just great. Yeah. I thought it was super fun. And I think that leads us to our next one, which is, um, is a amazing Paralympic athlete who had a very strategic and intense training approach. And this was, um, Matt Saltzman. He is famously known as the armless archer, and he has a really inspiring story that exemplifies resilience and innovation. So he was born without arms and Matt developed a remarkable technique for shooting with his feet with a specially designed release mechanism showcasing the incredible adaptability of human spirit. And I, if you've seen it, I, I have shot bows before in my life and I cannot always shoot straight. So I can't imagine trying to shoot with my feet and have it released by like my jaw like pressure in my jaw so seeing the archers that were shooting with their feet was so impressive but for Matt he to prepare for the pressures of competition Matt would engage in these high adrenaline activities like skydiving and car racing and he would then to go from this event and then he would as soon as he did the skydive and landed or rose, was driving the race car and finished, he used this unique training approach to not only push his limits, but also to serve a strategic purpose. You see in any of these events, like your heart rate increases and then he would land or finish and he would get out and then he would actually shoot his bow with an elevated heart rate. So this allowed him to control his emotions and maintain focus under stress. I mean, I was like, oh gracious, that is crazy, but really impressive way of training. So this is not only physical training, but this is mental training, which we know is crucial for athletes. It also helps them stimulate the high pressure conditions that they face during competitions and allowing them to perform their best, even under challenging situations. I think Matt's dedication and innovation training methods paid off because he clinched the gold medal in the Paris 2024 Olympics, proving that determination and ingenuity can break through any barriers. And his journey serves as just a powerful reminder that the right mindset and training can make anything possible. Uh, we say uh, work smart, not harder. And this is training smarter, not yep. feel harder, but <laughs> it's a very smart way of training, in my opinion. It's very impressive. <laughs> yes. Um, the final medical story of today is from my home country, Turkey, Turkey, from about a para swimmer, Sumeya Boyacı, who has competed in the Paris Paralympics, and it's about her mental resilience. I'm going to tell a little bit about her story. Uh, Sumeya Boyacı's journey as a para swimmer is nothing short of inspiring, in my opinion. She was born without arms. She first made her waves in international competition at 2019 World Para Swimming Championship. For the Paris 2024 Paralympics, Sumeya continued pushing her limits, training rigorously at the Turkish Olympic Preparation Center in Trabzon. She also did a high altitude camp in her preparation. Her focus was on refining her strength, speed, technique, especially after narrowly missing a medal in Tokyo 2020. 
Despite not reaching the podium again in Paris, her dedication remains a beacon of resilience and passion for her sport. A significant part of Sumeya's preparation for Paris 2024 was not just physical. We always speak about how important it is to have mental resilience. And for her, it was mental preparation as well. She worked hard to stay mentally sharp using visualization techniques and mindfulness. What really stands out for me is her personal approach to mental conditioning. She was keeping a performance journal where she tracked her training progress and identifying patterns in her performance. This journal helped her understand what worked, both physically and mentally, allowing her to make adjustments and build confidence. It's a testament to her self-awareness and commitment to continual improvement. Sumeya's story reminds us that success is not only measured by medals, but by personal growth. She's such an inspiring and rising star, and her ability to reflect on her performance, learning from her setbacks and training her body and mind highlights her holistic approach to being an athlete. What an inspiring story. Oh, I love that. I love seeing I love seeing the this these stories, but I love seeing the continuity between Olympians, Paralympians to show that it the disability doesn't define you and all athletes can use a lot of the same techniques in yeah. order to perform at their peak. I agree. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I know that it's super inspiring and I love that it came out of um, your home country. So love that story. Um, as we wrap up, wrap up today's episode, I want to give you guys a heads up um, on our next and final Paris episode for 2024. And it'll be featuring our incredible and knowledgeable and amazing sport pharmacist friends, Claire May from the United Kingdom and Somer Helvakia from Turkey who both um, volunteered at the 2024 Paris Paralympic Pharmacy Services. We'll have kind of a fireside chat with Claire and Selmer about their unique experience and discover their roles at the games, provide insight about the medical services, how the medical services were run at a major sporting event, and specifics about volunteering as a sports pharmacist. So I hope everyone stays tuned for this one. We're looking at, we're really excited about connecting with both of them. Yeah, that's a, a first-hand experience from our uh, amazing friends for sponsors. their inspiration to us and we'll get you the most interesting insights from just inside of the event's medical services. We thank you for joining us on this episode of the Performance Prescription Lab podcast. If you enjoyed this discussion, please subscribe to our channels on YouTube and all podcast platforms. Leave us a review and share this podcast with your friends. As sports pharmacists, it is our mission to provide accurate and evidence-based information to you for you to optimize your health and performance. When it comes to your health and well-being choices, consult with your physician or pharmacist, prioritize your safety, and always make the informed decisions. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, keep pushing your limits and continue to get inspired from all athletes around the world.